Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot is set to become Chicago's first one-term mayor since 1983, after coming in third during yesterday's municipal elections in the Windy City, earning just 16.8 percent of the vote. Lightfoot is officially out of the race. Her challengers, former Chicago Public School CEO Paul Vallis and Cook County Commissioner Brandon Johnson, will head to a runoff in April. The mayor conceded in front of supporters last night. Let's watch. Obviously, we didn't win the election today, but I stand here with my head held high and a heart full of gratitude. I am grateful to the millions of Chicagoans who came together as we made tough decisions, saw the struggles of our frontline workers, and beat back a deadly pandemic. that we work together to re remove a record number of guns off our streets, reduce homicides, and started making real progress on public safety. Now, the race was absolutely dominated by the topics of crime and policing, with Lightfoot's opponents posturing themselves as tougher on crime than the mayor. Paul Vallis, who received over 30 percent of yesterday's vote, tweeted last month, quote, crime is out of control and new leadership will make our city safer. That's why I'm running for mayor. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene had just this to say about Lightfoot's loss, quote, crime doesn't pay. So we will have a new mayor. So it's a runoff. So there'll be a new mayor regardless. She's out of the running. Uh, it's between these other two who both ran much tougher on crime uh, kind of uh, 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 campaigns. Um, crime does appear to be up in Chicago. I just checked the, let's see where it is here. Um, the city's police budget ballooned 17 percent from 2019 to a record $1.9 billion in 2023, but at the same time, crime incidents jumped 41 percent. Yeah, that seems to be the story. You know, this is not a, a tale about some progressive left-leaning mayor who cut police budgets and consequently saw crime go up and then got kicked out of her office. Progressives were jubilantly celebrating Lori Lightfoot leaving office precisely because she has done what tough on crime advocates wanted her to do. She's presided over this period, as you just mentioned, of increased police funding, and it hasn't actually made the lives of people in Chicago any better. It does have high crime rates. So the question is, is whomever comes in and fills her position going to do more of the same, or is there going to be some interrogation into actually what effectively lowers crime. Yeah, I mean, she's in one of those positions where she has pleased no one. She right. is not perceived as being tough enough on crime, and crime is, in fact, up. But she is also not a, a progressive who has been for defunding the police or something like that. She's she's not pleased me, libertarians. She, <laughs> she's on actually the one thing she was militantly like pro-police on was policing COVID infractions. Um, she gave this. Actually, I think we have this clip. Can you uh, bring up that, that press conference where she laid into, like, teens who are daring to attend illicit parties during COVID. Can we play that? Now, I've directed Superintendent Brown to order all police districts to give special attention to these parties. And this is how it's going to be. We will shut you down. We will cite you. And if we need to, we will arrest you and we will take you to jail, period. There should be nothing unambiguous about that. Don't make us treat you like a criminal. But if you act like a criminal and you violate the law and you refuse to do what is necessary to save lives in the city in the middle of a pandemic, we will take you to jail, period. She wasn't talking about gangs there. She was talking about people who, who wanted social contact during the pandemic. Look, so from my standpoint, good riddance. Yeah, and that's, that's nuts. That's, it's, that's all I need. I'm a single issue voter there. To, to stand there in a country with a mass incarceration problem in a city with as many problems as Chicago has, and for yeah. that to be your focus is absolutely nuts. And look, a lot of conservatives have also been dinging her for deflecting with stunts like this and by leaning in on certain identity issues, talking yep. about being a black woman. And she said in several interviews this week that this is why she, lo or, I mean, she lost literally yesterday, but she said before that, well, it's because I'm a black woman and they don't want a black woman in a leadership role. They elected her in the first place, obviously. Yeah. And um, when, now there's an interesting question of whether or not Johnson, who's Black Brandon Johnson is going to be able to kind of consolidate the black vote around him. It's a you know predominantly black city, uh, and in this first 
election. Obviously, to the extent that there is a black vote, it was divided between um, Lori Lightfoot Johnson and I think there were some smaller um, uh, other candidates who got a sm much smaller share of the vote. So we'll see what happens going forward. It'll be interesting. So Johnson seems to be positioned as the person who's I, I won't, I, it's the framing of less tough on crime, more tough on crime is a little bit meaningless. But I, I would say that Vallis has openly courted some of the more uh, draconian, I would argue, um, police. There's a police chief who apparently uh, was complimentary of, uh, seemed to endorse uh, one sixth in the, inter in the insurrection. And um, he, Ballas was getting dinged or criticized for accepting his endorsement and kind of butting it up with that guy. Johnson has never used the word defund and has stayed away from. Um, being associated with the more activist parts of police reform. If you endorse, if you endorse one six, does that make you tough on cops? <laughs> in that you like tough on crime or tough on cops? I don't. Since the framing it's, is so it's, difficult it's here. It's unclear. This is definitely this is definitely one to watch uh. though. Uh, well, according to new reporting in the Hill, Republicans nationwide are retooling their message on crime after failing to fully tap into the issue during midterms. One GOP strategist told The Hill, quote, Lee Zeldin ran a one-issue campaign on the issue of crime. Every day, he was at a metro stop or a corner store where somebody got shot or mugged. It's the clearest and easiest way for Republicans to tag Democrats to their fringe of the party. It wasn't enough, but he did. He did pretty well. Um, he probably had some down ballot successes because of uh, the campaign that he ran, and he got close. I, I would say it's, it's not always going to be enough, but... Um, uh, Clearly, the, some aspect of the Republican message on this is resonating with people who hadn't normally voted Republican or hadn't recently voted Republican. Yeah, I, I think the, the way that the Republicans can succeed with this is if Democrats take the bait and turn themselves into Republican light versions. Because if at that point, all they're doing is d d depressing the Democrat turnout. When it's not clear that at least in places like New York, you're really meaningfully doing anything to increase the share of the Republican vote. Now, I think that everybody cares about crime, but what both Republicans and Democrats are going to have to figure out is how to have messaging, not just messaging, but policies that address legitimate concerns about crime, but that actually do something about crime and aren't just a virtue signaling about how I love cops more, I'm going to fund the police harder. Like the stat you just read in Chicago is so instructive. Crime budgets are swelling across the country. After um, uh, uh, the 2020 uh, protest, the George Floyd protest, outside of some very small moments across the country, in particular municipalities that are very progressive, crime budgets swelled. Joe Biden ran in the middle of those protests saying, I love cops, we need to fund the cops harder, and that is exactly what has happened. So I think that part of what the problem is with the Republican messaging is that they're saying they're going to be tough on crime, but if the Democrats are also being tough on crime and the budget, police budgets are going up, it's not clear exactly what they're going to do about it and if it's going to manifest in real world outcomes. Well, it definitely matters how this money is being spent. If, they're, if they get larger budgets and they spend it on hiring more qualified and competent homicide detectives and they're going to clear mm -hmm. more cases, that could have a deterrent effect on crime. If they spend that money on like more SWAT team military gear to knock down people's houses in the middle of the night or stand around while a mass shooting takes place, then that's obviously not going to have any effect on crime. Yeah, look, I, I think it's important to be able to solve cases. And I think, you know, hiring more homicide detectives of all the things that they spend money on seems uh, among the more reasonable mm -hmm. things. But I don't know about the deterrent effect aspect of that. I don't, it, studies have shown that, you know, raising criminal penalties, putting in jail, people in jail for a longer time, but, you know, not a longer make, time, but, but making people feel more certain that they're going to be arrested. But I think this. I, well, my understanding is the study showed that certainty of arrest does have a deterrent effect, not length of sentence. Mm. But if you're sure you're going to get so you could actually have shorter sentences if it's like, yeah, bam, you got you got caught straight back to jail. It's not about putting because there's a there's a at some point if. The, it being so long, the sentence, then it ha it, it's like uh, it, you can't even comprehend it. It's, so it's like yeah. beyond the realm of imagination. Yeah. But if the certainty of actually getting caught, I have seen yeah, some that, people that, say that, that could there, be. It I'd has, be open to looking at those statistics. Effect. And I'd also really hope that people look at statistics about, I'm sorry, the role that poverty plays. I was having this discussion mm -hmm. with some people in my own community. I was actually at the, at the nail salon, and they had, they've been broken into, my nail salon's been broken into several times, uh, twice in the last month. And another customer came in, and we were all talking about the break-ins that we've experienced in the neighborhood and that we know of. And, and their, their theory was that they're, they've, they've seen people post-COVID aimless 
increasingly youth disaffected, mm -hmm. nowhere to go, unemployed. One woman was frustrated that the city keeps trying to blame it on the um, dispensaries that have opened in the neighborhood. She is a person who enjoys those dispensaries herself and doesn't feel like that was the issue, um, but that she d has noticed more wayward youth. And it's like, are we going to address the things, the material th changes that have come in the post-COVID years with the precarity, the inflation, all of the things, the, the housing um, precarity, all of the things that we discuss on this show all the time, yeah. or is there only going to be the punitive approach on the other end? Is yeah. someone even going to offer a com combination approach, or are we just going to see police budgets continue to swell until they're they're already about 50% of a lot of these major city budgets? What's it going to be, 60 70 80% before we ask whether or not putting that money into social services mm -hmm. so that people don't feel maybe social what they services, need to steal. Many of which were shut down during the pandemic, yeah. which was a really bad sure. thing for, sure. uh, for society. Sure. Well, my hair salon had a, uh, had a, a car <laughs> came past. This has nothing to do with crime, but it was just a funny story. I was there last week. A car came and drove down the sidewalk in front of the in front of the salon, like all the way on the sidewalk. Like there's a tree on the, it, it was like between the tree and the, it wasn't like just partly Why? on the sidewalk. I have no idea. They showed me, the, it had just happened when I got there. They showed me the footage. They all took on it with their cell phones. Crazy. It's all crazy right. out there. Well, your hair came out great, Robbie. Thank you, Brianna. <laughs> I really wanted, that's what I was hoping for. I was hoping to get the compliment out of this discussion. Oh, man. Well, more more rising, rising after this. <laughs>